Michael Walzer, the great political philosopher, once said that the challenge of America is to embrace its differences and maintain a common life. And that's the theme of my talk. It's going to be democracy and diversity. And I want to tell you when diversity kind of first made a powerful impression upon my life and on the way I, and, and the work that I do and the way that, that I decided to live my life. Uh, it's my first day on the campus of the University of Illinois, 15 or 16 years ago. I walk into the gym to play basketball, and I notice that there are three games going on. There's a black game, there's a white game, and an Asian game. And I'm asking myself, which game am I going to play in? And I realized something. All of my life, growing up in the western suburbs of Chicago, I have played in the white game. And not only that, I have shed the other parts of myself. I refused to learn uh, Indian languages growing up. I refused to learn Indian cooking in order to play in the white game. And my whole college career after that became about the challenge of racial diversity, ethnic diversity. Why is it that some people feel so marginalized because of their color and because of their ethnic heritage? And I would go home and I would regale my father about, you know, uh, we're, dad, we're Indian. And why is it that we don't, you know, we don't have more friends who are people of color? Uh, why is it that you chose to move to Glen Ellen instead of, uh, instead of moving to Rogers Park in Chicago with more Asians, uh, et cetera, et cetera? I, and you know, this was because I was, uh, I was 18 and in college, and all of the, this head full of kind of radical spangles was uh, what I was what I had, I would, this would all be kind of combined with the class critique of my father, and I would go home and, you know, my dad banned the word bourgeois from the house. <laughs> I couldn't, couldn't come home for Thanksgiving if I wanted to use that word. Um, my dad looked up at me uh, my second or third year in college and said, you know, Ibu, I, I understand what you're saying. Uh, he said, I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm not stupid. I'm one of the first Indians in a senior position in corporate advertising in Chicago. And I started there, I started at Leo Burnett in the late 1970s. I, I understand exactly what you're talking about. But it strikes me that whenever you talk about diversity, you talk about race, ethnicity, gender, class, sometimes sexuality. These things are all hugely important. But do you not read the newspaper? Do you not watch the evening news? Because the type of diversity you never talk about is the type that's blowing the world up, and that's religion. And he was right. I mean, this was the mid-1990s, and as I started paying attention to the news and reading the New York Times, it was religious conflict in the Balkans. It was religious conflict in Northern Ireland. It was religious conflict in the Middle East. In the mid-late 1990s, India explodes a nuclear bomb, calls it the Hindu bomb. Pakistan explodes a nuclear bomb, calls it the Muslim bomb. In sociology classes in college, in dorm room discussions, the word religion and religious diversity might have come up, I don't know, five times throughout my whole college career. I thought to myself, why are we missing out on one of the great stories of this era, which is that it seems that too often when people from different religious communities gather in close quarters, there's conflict. I started kind of paying attention to that narrative. And I noticed that, my gosh, the 1990s was in some ways a decade of religious violence. You have the first World Trade Center bombing in 1993. That's an early Al-Qaeda move. Of course, you have the growth of Al-Qaeda during the decade. In 1995, you have the assassination of, of Yitzhak Rabin by uh, Yigal Amir. You have continuing conflict in Sri Lanka. You have the Omagh bombing in Northern Ireland. It's very much a decade of religious violence, but this is not a narrative that's particularly strung together by the diversity or the, multi or the multicultural movement. And then something else occurred to me, and it kind of came to me like a flash one morning, that so many of my heroes, and I was not a particularly religious person in college, but so many of my heroes, and I imagine that many of these are your heroes also, Dorothy Day, Jane Addams, Martin Luther King Jr., Mahatma Gandhi, Nelson Mandela, Mother Teresa, Desmond Tutu, Thich Nhat Hanh, the Dalai Lama, Farid Essak, Malcolm X, Bacha Khan, the list goes on and on. 
many of the heroes of the 20th century were people of faith. And faith was not ancillary to who they were. It was who they were. The King said in his famous speech against the Vietnam War in 1967 at Riverside Church, he said that higher to me than any commitment to nation or to race or to creed is the idea of my sonship to Jesus Christ. That is who I am. He said, people make of me many things, but at bottom, I'm the son of a Baptist preacher and I'm the grandson of a Baptist preacher. And it is that tradition that calls the tune that I follow. I noticed one more thing, that so many of the acts of violence committed in the name of God to the soundtrack of prayer in the 1990s were committed by young people. Yigal Amir, the assassin of Yitzhak Rabin, is 26 years old. Benjamin Smith, guy who goes on a rampage through the Midwest, killing Jews, African Americans, and Asian Americans in the name of the World Church of the Creator, part of the Christian identity movement, is like 21 years old. You start asking yourself, and you think about this, right? Like when you read the newspaper today and you see stories about religious violence, you just expect to see an 18-year-old associated with it or a 24-year-old. It's almost like you, know, you don't even, it's, it's, just, it's just kind of written into the DNA of the human race that it's going to be young people who are on the front lines of religious violence. And something else occurred to me. You know how old King was in Montgomery when he led the bus boycott? 26. How old was Gandhi when he started his movement against racist pass laws in South Africa? 24. How old was Jane Addams when she started Hull House? 28. How old was the Dalai Lama when he leads his people out of occupied Tibet into India? Barely out of his teens. I'm 19 years old, right? I see the world, admittedly, in a somewhat black and white way. But effectively, what I'm seeing is an era where young people are on the front lines of religious violence, and I'm looking at, at previous eras where young people were on the front lines of being faith heroes. And I notice something else, that what's at the center of religious violence? The destruction of people different from you. Who did Benjamin Smith kill? Jews, African Americans, and Asian Americans in the name of white supremacy, grounded in a perverted notion of Christian theology. What does Osama bin Laden say? Kill the Jews and the Crusaders and the Muslims who are not like us. Religious extremism is profoundly grounded in the notion that only my people should dominate and everyone else should suffocate. And what did our faith heroes do? They built movements of religious pluralism. What makes King Gandhi, Bacha Khan, Mandela, Tutu, what makes these people remarkable is not just that they led movements for their own religious community or racial community, but that they led movements that built societies where everybody could live in what I call equal dignity and mutual loyalty. It's the quick story of King here. In 1950, King is a 20-year-old seminary student, Crozier Theological Seminary in Pennsylvania. He travels on a spring night to Philadelphia to hear a great intellectual, Mordecai Johnson, give a talk on Christian pacifism. Who is the embodiment of Christian pacifism that Johnson talks about? A Hindu from India named Mahatma Gandhi. And King doesn't think to himself, well, gosh, my Christianity means I got to oppose that guy because he's a Hindu. King thinks to himself, gosh, there's something deeply embedded in Gandhi's Hinduism that connects to a deeply embedded value in my Christianity. That's the notion of love and nonviolence. And five years later, when King leads the bus boycott, he says that for him, it's Christ who furnishes the inspiration and Gandhi, an Indian Hindu, who furnishes the method. Four years later, King takes the idea of religious diversity so seriously. This, again, is not ancillary to who he is. It's central to who he is. He goes to India to study Gandhi's movement. And what he finds is that it's not just a Hindu movement. Satyagraha, truth force, is a movement of Sikhs and Jains and Buddhists and Christians and Hindus and Muslims and non-religious people. In fact, Gandhi's closest companion in Satyagraha was probably a Muslim. Bacha Khan, often, often called the frontier Gandhi. King comes back to Montgomery, Alabama, steps up in the pulpit of a provincial church in the American South, and the year is not yet 1960, and he speaks these words, Oh God, we call you this name. We know some call you Elohim, 
We know some call you Allah. We know some call you the unmoved mover. Right? I mean, think about the vastness of that interfaith consciousness at that time. In 1963, King comes to Chicago to give one of his famous speeches at the Chicago Conference on Religion and Race. He quotes from the Hebrew prophets, Amos in particular, let justice rain down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. And in the back of that room is an Orthodox rabbi, barely escaped Hitler's death camps in Eastern Europe, Abraham Joshua Heschel, six weeks away from being burned at Auschwitz. And he listens to King and he says, the soul of Judaism is at stake in this movement. And two years later, he marches with King in Selma. He's the guy with the big beard and that famous picture of King and the others at Selma. And, and afterwards, he writes, it felt like my legs were praying. Right? That's America, you know? That's America. And I'm watching this happen. I'm watching this happen. And, and, and I'm thinking that there, there's this great line by W.E.B. Du Bois, the great African-American scholar, 100 years ago. The problem of the 20th century would be the problem of the color line. And it was. And it is. But it's not the only problem in the 21st century. We also have a faith line in the 21st century. And the problem is how we define the faith line. And what I would like to suggest is that we have to import King's definition of the color line into how we view the faith line. Because Du Bois didn't ultimately define who the color line divided. It was King who offered the most insightful, powerful definition of that. And King said, the color line does not divide white people and black people or Easterners and Westerners. The color line divides people who would live together as brothers and people who would perish together as fools. And the worst thing we can do is to define the faith line as Christians versus Muslims or as secularists versus believers because that will write us into an endless war. 1.3 billion Muslims on the planet and 2 billion Christians. Let me tell you something. You pit those two groups against each other, we're never going to stop fighting these wars. The only way to define the faith line in a way where everybody wins is to define it as pluralism versus totalitarianism. Pluralism is a one-line definition building a society where people from different backgrounds live in equal dignity and mutual loyalty. That's pluralism. Okay? Totalitarianism has a one-line definition. People who want only their group to dominate and everyone else to suffocate. Right? Our job in America and increasingly around the world is to try to nurture pluralism.